Oh my God, I can't even, oh my God. She's beautiful, frankly. I have no words. I'm in Jersey. What would I do <clears> if <throat> I a Ferrari? Where are we going? That was like the coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Today we finally get to announce to the world, it's time to meet our all-star. All right, <clears throat> so uh, welcome to the redo of tutorial number one for, um, we had a technical issue the last broadcast, but hopefully this one will uh, take care of some of that. This is um, lesson one on building a 3D crate in Blender. Uh, so this is what we are going to accomplish right now in uh, Blender. I'll show you what the finished product looks like for future video users. Sorry, that's my daughter running through the room. Let's let Unity open. <clears throat> okay, so um, I have two different versions of the crate, one with an older texture um, and one with a newer and a little more refined texture. So, um, So what this series does is it's going to show us uh, how to not only use some basic 3D tools, but also create this uh, crate object. And um, this is mainly meant as a introductory tutorial. It's not necessarily a how to make something that you're going to use in every uh, game or portfolio piece right now, but this <clears throat> this shows us a good checklist of features of both uh, Blender and the Quixel, whoops, uh, the Quixel um, Suite 2.0 that you'll be able to use to create some really cool portfolio ready items. Um, and I'll go over why this is not quite portfolio ready, but um, as, as we go along, but for right now, again, this is going to show you a series of tools that you're going to be able to use to make your own uh, stuff. So <clears throat> let's dive right in. All right, so here we have a simple crate object. And the goal of this is to look at some basic modeling techniques as well as um, some modifiers and uh, a little bit of basic UV mapping. So, uh, well, in this this tutorial, it's not going to show the UV mapping. Later ones will, but uh, so this one is going to show some basic uh, modeling techniques. So, you can see the the wireframe of this is pretty simple. Now, the reason that I say it's not a portfolio ready piece, again, I, I we're doing this so that you uh, the learner can see some basic techniques, including the use of modifiers. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so if we go up to the top uh, of the, the window here, uh, right below the actual top of the window bar, there's all this stuff up here, file, render, window, help, etc., etc. At the end, after the blender icon <clears throat> and the version number, it displays how many vertices, edges, faces, triangles, and how much memory the cube consumes, or how about how much uh, memory our object consumes. And if we see our triangles, that's 
what uh, a lot of game objects are measured in when you discuss um, 3D modeled objects in games uh, among professionals, they're going to talk about the tries an object has. 620 is a little high for a, a, a crate. Uh, you know, you usually might see a, a nicer, fancier one that you're going to be able to look up close at in the 300s or so. Um, you know, maybe even less than that because, you know, you don't spend a whole lot of time focusing on crates. Uh, so this is a bit high because of the bevel um, modifier that we're going to use. But again, uh, once you're done with this, you'll know how to use all these tools that you'll be able to then apply to some really cool stuff. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to start a new file, reload startup file. And let me just do a quick check on the Twitch channel to see if people are watching. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, cool. There is a person. Um, great. Well, hello, person, uh, whoever you are. I can't have both windows up, but I'm glad somebody's looking at it right now. So, um, <clears throat> so we're starting with a basic cube. Now, let me explain how I got to this point by... Oops. All right, so typically Blender will start you off with this screen. This is what you see when you first open Blender. So uh, I'm not going to go through the entire, entire interface. I'm going to try to, you know, talk my way through how I use all the keyboard shortcuts and things like that. Um, but <clears throat> what I will show you is uh, how to manipulate the interface a bit so that you can customize it to your liking. Uh, Blender is unique among a lot of other programs in that you can manipulate the interface in such a way that uh, you can lay it out the way you'd like. So not a whole lot of other 3D art programs do this. It's very useful because Blender actually has a number of different, so if I uh, take my mouse, go down to the lower left-hand corner of this 3D window, and you see this uh, cube, this little button with a cube and two arrows down in the lower left-hand corner of the 3D window, and I click it, I get this whole list. There's all these different editors. Now, <clears throat> most of these won't even be important to us in uh this, this uh, course, whether you're taking my in-person course or you've just found these YouTube videos. Um, but I can explain, you know, to give you some context, what all Blender has inside of it. It's a Python console so that you can write your own plugins in Python programming language. File browser, that's for looking at your files. Info and user preferences, if you're hearing a toddler scream, my apologies, that's uh, it's bath time. Um, info user preferences, those are just some housekeeping things. The user preferences has some cool stuff that we can go over later. Outliner actually is open. It's a list of everything in your scenes. Uh, that's open by default in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, properties, that's on the right-hand of the screen under the outliner, this is where we're going to be doing a lot of our object manipulation and use of modifiers and, and playing with materials and things like that. Logic Editor, we never need that, but Blender actually has a game engine in it, a working game engine. Um, it's okay. Uh, it doesn't really export to many platforms, so it's not widely used, but it has a game engine, and that's how you program in it with that Logic Editor. Node Editor is for some advanced material creation. Text Editor is basically a notepad. Movie Clip Editor, you can edit movies in it. Same thing with uh, Video Sequencing Editor. Those two tools let you uh, edit movies in it. So you can do some Adobe Premiere-esque things. UV Image Editor, we will make extensive use of that for um, texturing. NLA, that's for animation. We're not 
going to be covering some of that, not at least in this tutorial series. Um, and for games, because this is going to be a lot of game-focused stuff, uh, you don't really often use the NLA. That's for if you're doing full-on animation. Dope Sheet, you would use that in game animation. Same thing with Graph Editor, you'd use some of that. And then Timeline is actually already here at the bottom. So that's what this all has in it. Um, so if you did need to use a lot of these features, you can customize the interface to your liking. And we're going to do a little bit of that now. So I have one, um, one window open to look at my 3D cube, but I like to work in front and side views. So I'm going to actually split this into two. The way I do this is I have my mouse over the actual 3D view, uh, the actual window within which I can see my 3D cube. So I'm going to go to the upper right hand corner of this and there's going to be this little pattern where it looks like somebody scored the edge of or the upper corner of this with a knife or something. So <clears throat> you want to hover over that with your mouse and it'll turn into a plus sign. Left, mountain, uh, left mouse button click down and drag and you'll get a whole new window. I'm going to hit the T key over this new window and that makes that toolbar disappear. Um, so I have that whole new window. So both of these you can see are in user perspective mode. So first thing I want to do is turn off perspective. So I'm going to use my five on my number pad now uh, on both and that turns off perspective. Now some of you, uh, if you're using a Mac, uh, or a laptop without a number pad may be like, but how do I do this without a number pad? Um, I'll show you how. So <clears throat> if I drag down, uh, well, let, let's do it here for ease of use. I'm going to go down to the lower left-hand corner of one of my editors. I'll just use one of my 3D editors for the sake of uh, time here. And I will click it, and I will go to User Preferences. And that gives me all these user preferences. Uh, if I go to input, which is, you see all these tabs up on the top, I can go to the input tab. And then along the right side here, there's one that says emulate numpad. If I click that, then all my number keys on my main, um, my main keyboard at the top, so where you usually type numbers for uh, you know, in Microsoft Word and things like that, that will become your keys to manipulate your view instead of the number pad if you don't have a number pad. So know that that exists. Um, for those who can't get over Blender's right click to uh, I'll actually go over some of the, the other basic controls here in a second, but uh, let's just say Blender uses right click to do most uh, selection operations. If you really can't get over that, this is also where you can under select with, you can switch to left and right. Um, so you can make those changes if you'd like. I'm actually not going to make any changes because I have it set up the way I like it. Um, so how do we actually manipulate things in this here blender? Uh, well, so I just showed you how to open up your interface, but the other thing, uh, you probably want to know how to look around at this cube. To do so, <clears throat> so the first thing you want to do is orbit. This is probably the most important viewing function in 3D art. To do this in Blender, you hold down your middle mouse button, if you have a, a mouse with a wheel, which you should. But you hold down your middle mouse button, and under those inputs there actually is a uh, selection for uh, emulating this with like shift and the left mouse button, but I highly recommend, it's something like that, I can't remember what it is, but um, I highly recommend buying a cheap uh, three button mouse. I have a Logitech three button mouse uh, for, you know, it has no cord or anything, it's very nice, um, but I have it for like 15 bucks. So that's, considering this is free software, that's a pretty, pretty good deal. Um, to be able to use it with a good level of, uh, of use. So middle mouse button, hold it down, move the mouse around, and you can orbit. So this is what you're going to do to look around your model. 
Um, you don't want to actually rotate the model. Uh, you just want to use the, the orbit function. To pan, um, you are going to hold down shift and the middle mouse button. And then to zoom, it's just using the mouse wheel. The other thing you can do is hold down, uh, there is a, maybe I'm misremembering something. For, for zoom, just use the middle mouse wheel. All right, so that's how to uh, manipulate the view. And then the other ways to manipulate the view, and I'm going to do something real quick here. Um, to uh, look at the front view, and I'm going to, in my left viewport here, I'm going to look at the front front view. It's number pad, or if you've done the emulate num pad, uh, you know, it's number one, either on your num pad or if you're using the emulate num pad function on the top of your keyboard. Uh, and then on my right one, I'm going to look at it from the right side. Well, yeah. Uh, which, well, towards the right, it's actually looking at it from its left, uh, towards the right, and that is the three key. So one is front, three is right view. Uh, if you ever want to look at the top, that's seven. And if you ever want to turn on and off perspective, that is five. So remember that. Um, and then... If, if you, uh, if you want to look at the back, so any opposite of these three main views, front, so, uh, front, right, or top, is control and that, um, fun and that button. So control one is to look at the back, control seven is bottom, control three is to look at it from its right looking towards the left. So, and then two, four, and eight do different things with tilting the view. You're not going to use those very often. Those are really useful um, once you get to animating characters, but that's a little ways away. So we're not going to worry about it too much right now. Um, so that's the basic view stuff. Uh, if we need anything from menus and stuff like that, we'll... we'll look at it in a context sensitive basis. So um, right now I'm going to, um, so I have my cube selected. Now to select things in Blender, you right click on them. And that's really weird. And I'm going to tell you why you do that um, in Blender. So I, I click on it. And so here I am right clicking away. So why right click? Well, <clears throat> there's this crosshair in the middle of this, uh, of this cube. And it has this sort of candy cane red and white line around it. And the reason for that is that it's an actual object. It's not just part of the interface. It is uh, called the 3D cursor. Now, the 3D cursor is probably one of the weirdest parts of Blender compared to other programs, but also one of the, the coolest parts because once you really know what it does, once you have an idea of its versatility, you're... Um, You'll wish it was in everything. And it's hard to tell you exactly why, um, you know, it puts, uh, puts you in situations where this would be incredibly, incredibly useful. So for one example, um, I can use this drop down down here with the two little circles um, that looks like a Venn diagram. I could select the 3D cursor. If I rotated this, I could have it use the 3D cursor as the center of rotation for this object. Now, why is that useful? Well, for this, it's really not useful. The most useful thing is median point, which was what it was already set to. But that's one example of a use of a 3D cursor that in other operations is really fantastic. Um, I use it quite a bit, again, when I do uh, more advanced character animation and stuff like that. So. Uh, what it is really cool for right now of immediate use to us is that if I hit Shift and A, 
and create a new object, let's say monkey, because who doesn't love to create monkeys, um, it appears where the 3D cursor was. So that's a really cool way for you to be able to specify um, where you want where you want uh, 3D stuff to occur. So you know that's pretty cool. Let me see if I can get womp womp object font curve on font. Nope. Oh, I thought I was going to say monkeys. Oh well. Fine text. Um, so now that I've added a bunch of monkeys that we're not actually going to work with, I'm going to select my monkeys. Uh, so right click to select one, shift and right click to select another one. Um, and you'll notice, and this is important, but it's not going to seem important, but um, one has a more dull orange outline and one has a brighter orange outline. And the one with the brighter orange outline is quote unquote the active object, which means if I go into edit mode, it goes into the active objects edit mode. Just be aware when you have multiple objects selected, which one is the active object, because it matters when you do operations like this. Um, so I shift and selected uh, for both monkeys. So if you're a familiar, uh, a person familiar with Photoshop, uh, shift select is, you know, shift select is the uh, key of choice for multiple selections for these uh, types of programs. So that should be, uh, it, you know, if you're an art program user, that should not be totally new territory for you. Anyway, so we've shift selected. Now I'm going to hit the X key, and that's going to delete objects. So it'll say, do you want to delete? You'll say yes. Um, X is delete. You know, know that. That is very important. Because if you ever say want to delete um, a vertex, boom, vertex deleted. And then our, uh, or if you do something like that and didn't want to do it like I just did. I did want to do it, but oh no, pretend I didn't. What's wrong? I have to make a new box. No, I don't. Our old friend Control Z is here. Control Z is undo, which brings me to uh, one of our mindset lessons of 3D art is don't be afraid of the 3D art. Uh, 3D art is actually, you know, like anything on a computer, it's undoable, it's fixable, it's recoverable. So you're not going to, you're not going to break the computer by doing the 3D art. And if you do make a broken model, that's okay. You can either go back to a previous save, which you should save often because these programs like to crash. Um, Blender, much less than some other ones, looking at you, 3D Max. Um, but the uh, you can recover stuff and you can control Z stuff. So. Always make sure, if you do something silly, uh, remember Control z is there, and you can undo uh, quite a bit. I think Blender goes about 20 steps back, so you have a good, good uh, margin of error. So, uh, now we want to actually make a crate out of this thing instead of listening to me talk about Interface and Control z So, how do we do that? Well, I have my front and my right view I'm going, to call, I'm going to call it side view, just understand that side equals right. Um, and I'm going to hit the tab key, that's going to go into edit mode. So there's, here we have different modes. There's object mode and edit mode. Object mode is when we manipulate objects at their uneditable level. So it's just kind of moving boxes around. So imagine these like boxes, you've just moved to a new apartment. Now we're moving the boxes around, okay? So edit mode is what happens when you go inside and you want to change the boxes. You're like, I really need to get that book on Blender or on uh, Rene Magritte art. Uh, you know, you're going to go inside and start messing with the stuff inside the boxes. So uh, it's important to know this because 
Blender has the object version of the box, which is the box, and then the stuff inside the box, which is the edit mode version of the box. I make I point this out because you can add geometry inside the box. You're going to add a monkey. But guess what? The monkey is inside the box. It's not inside this cube. You know, we could do that. We could put it inside the cube. But that's not what I said. You know, there it is. It is physically inside the cube. But actually, it's inside. Oh, its eyes aren't. Whoops. Um, well, its eyes are. Okay, so now we have three meshes to deal with inside the object. So you have object level. Think of it as a box or a container. But you see each of these separate one, two, three, four meshes is inside that, that object. So an object can contain different meshes. Okay? It's important to note this because remember that computers are dumb. I know you've been hearing that in all computer classes you've ever taken since since elementary or middle, uh, middle school. Computers are stupid. So they only really know what you tell it to do. Um, so for example, if I were to take two cube, OK, make another cube, and kind of like mash it together, you know, the, the, the program isn't going to know that these two things are mashed together and combine them in any sort of meaningful way. It's just going to like position them next to one another. But they're still two distinctly different cubes. So, you know, you're you're not you've never commanded them to morph into one mesh. They remain two meshes, but they don't combine. They just happen to coexist in space. So remember that. Objects can contain multiple meshes. Okay? I know that's gonna get that's a weird way of thinking, but Remember that when you're thinking about like how Blender works and how 3D art works. Because it's not just Blender that works this way. Other 3D programs work this way. Um, you know, they usually call these elements. So know that elements are a thing that can exist. And it's always, uh, Blender's always going to treat elements as separate pieces unless you make them not separate pieces. Okay. So now we're going to model our crate with this box in edit mode and we reach edit mode with the tab key so we're gonna model this in edit mode in such a way that it is going to be one mesh one element okay so we have our box front view side view we are all educated in how blender works conceptually um, as objects and editable meshes and stuff like that so now we're going to get into the real meat of this. We're going to hit the control key and the R key at the same time. And what does that do? Well, that brought up uh, mesh loop cut. Now it doesn't look like anything. So I'm going to go into a more 3D view. You don't have to do this. But for the sake of showing you what I'm doing, control R. All right. So now I have this weird magenta line. What is it? So, and I can move my mouse around and it changes what axis, uh, axis it's on. Blah, blah, blah. Try saying that 10 times fast. This is um, the line, this is a function that lets you take a, imagine you had like an invisible katana and we're in a, uh, there's a lot of game makers in this course so I'm going to, uh, you know, talk about katanas because that's cool. Um, so imagine I had a, an invisible katana, and I'm going to just take a big swipe through our, our cube. That's what this is going to do. This is going to take a big swipe through our cube and make different geometry. So if I did that, new edges have been made that I can manipulate. See? So 
you're basically taking a big old cut right through the center of this. Now, let's say I don't actually want to have it right through the center, which I don't. I'm going to do this again. Control R. I'm going to do it with my, my handy dandy orthogonal view from the front because now you don't need to see what this does. Um, so vertical, so I, now I'm going to move my mouse wheel up one uh, until that happens. Now what just happened? This means it's going to take two cuts because we are super fast ninja. Uh, we can take as many cuts as we want, in fact, um, but that's just silly. So we're not going to take that many cuts. We're going to... We're going to make two cuts. If I click, and then it actually gets kind of slidey, and that's cool because uh, we want to be able to sometimes say where along the mesh we want to do that, except right now. So let's just hit Escape, and it'll give me that. So now I'm going to hit S and X. Now S, then X. And then I can scale. So S is scale. this way. Okay, so now all I did was I cut and then I scaled so that this middle portion is very wide. Alright, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go back into my front view, control and R. Then I'm going to go up one with my middle mouse button, left click, hit escape, scale, Z, so S then the Z key to do it along the Z axis. So anytime you perform an operation, now when I say an operation, we already saw scale. Now in normal circumstances, scale does this. But now we've already seen some other cool uses of it. There's also move, which is G. So let me explain the logic of Blender's shortcuts. For the most part, its shortcuts are the first letter that the thing you want to do begins with. Um, sometimes you just have to be creative in what, what you want to do is. So G is grab and move. That's why I say you got to be creative. Uh, so that one stretches logic a little bit, but it's G. So uh, G, grab. And that lets you... Technically, this is called transform, but nobody calls it transform. They call it move. Um, but if you ever see transform written in a tutorial or anything, that's what it is. Uh, we already went over a scale. Whoa! Whoa! Control reference for everybody. And then there's also R, which is rotate. The cool thing about these, when I said uh, op these operations, if I hit... Now, let's say I want to move something only side to side, aka along the x-axis, which is this red axis that moves left to right in Blender. Um, so G, and then if I hit X, nope, I have to have it selected first. I have my object selected, G, then X. I can move now only along the x-axis. Blender is a program in which Z the Z axis is up, so G and Z moves up and down. G and Y is backwards and forwards. Okay, so there's also this gizmo here. You can do this if you so choose. Use the actual mouse input. Um, it's up to you. There's really no better way uh, one over the other. It's a total matter of personal preference. I find it a little faster for myself to use the, the um, key to go G and X, but you know you may be a person that really just likes to manipulate the, the gizmo. When I say the gizmo, I mean this, this, uh, this little transform thing with the different arrows here. So, all right, um, that's basic move scale rotate, I'm going to go back into edit mode, and there's our geometry as we left it. We still need to make some more loop cuts. I'm going to go into my right viewport. I'm going to do 
the operation again where I whoops where I loop cut and scale that time along the the y axis and I'm you know in case you haven't noticed I'm generally trying to keep these more or less even in the corners and that's not so bad um all right not not too shabby so uh next i want to do the uh next i want to indent the actual crate itself so to do that i'm going to uh so right now i've mainly been in edge manipulation mode. If I hit shift and then tab, nope, that's not what I want. Control tab, yes. Control and then tab, sorry. Control tab at the same time. I bring up mesh select mode, which means that I can select different parts of the geometry. This is also available down here at the bottom of the 3D uh, viewport. So there's these buttons. There's this one that says edit mode, then this circle one, which is actually how you can, like different ways to view. Um, we might mainly want to work just in solid, but I'll show you how to really quickly move between solid and wireframe here in a sec. Then there's all this stuff that <clears throat> we frankly don't really, uh, oh, well, these are just how you select move, scale, rotate, except, you know, we already know the shortcuts for those, but there's move, scale, rotate. Yeah, translate. It's not just it's not transform here. It's translate. So that's how you select those, and then you have vertex edge uh, face here. So vertex. Think back to um, you know middle school or high school, whenever you took a geometry or like learning about basic geometric concepts. A vertex is a point. A vertex is a point in space. The line between two vertices, boom, boom, is an edge. So there's your edge. And then the connection between two edges, which also includes the edges that are created if you were to extrude an edge outward, like so is a face okay so again control tab you can manipulate either the points of an object the edges of an object or the faces of an object and we'll go over uh, i mean you'll get a sense as you work when it's best to manipulate different types of objects in this case now that we want to extrude these pieces inward to make a more interesting looking crate, we're going to use the face manipulation mode. So again, if you haven't, control tab, face, or down here, face. So I'm going to go back to front view, and I'm going to hit the Z key by itself. That's going to go into wireframe mode. We want to go into wireframe mode because let me select my top face. I'm going to select my top face. I'm going to go into front. Look at it in wireframe mode with Z. All right, so I want to indent this and I want to be pretty precise about it because I want this to look relatively uniform throughout. So I'm going to uh, now with my top face selected, front with one, Z, wireframe, I'm going to hit the E key and that's going to only let me go up and down because uh, when you extrude, E is for extrude. Um, this is like the most technical episode of Sesame Street you've ever seen, basically. Um, when you use E for extrude, it only lets you go uh, perpendicular to like whichever way the face you were wanting to extrude was, uh, was set into the object. So think about that. You know, it's automatically going to, to give you that, um, 
it's automatically going to make it perpendicular to it, which in this case is up and down straight. So um, I'm going to extrude inward about halfway between like the very top of this object and the cuts that we made. Okay, so I'm going to do grab a side, do the same thing. Now, this is really easy, so I'm not going to like go step by step through this. You've, you know, grab, grab one of these bits, front, E for extrude. Da, 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 da. Looking for ones where I didn't do that. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to need to go into my side viewport, E extrude. And so 3D art, I'm going to tell you right now, is a lot of repetition and perhaps even one might say tedium. Um, but there we go, we have our crate. Now you can stop here, and actually, in most cases, this is good enough for a crate, honestly. This is, this is in most cases, pretty decent. And then you can just put a cool texture on it, and your, your game engine will probably have something in it so that the edges won't look quite so sharp or you know you can change the the way it's shaded so it doesn't quite look so sharp um, but I want to show you one more thing this will help give it sort of a sci-fi ish look um, and that's using modifiers so I'm gonna hit tab to get it into object mode again and then I'm going to go over to my uh, rightmost panel, which is the, um, what is this called? I always change the order of the list. Uh, or properties, properties, properties panel. And properties is going to have a bunch of different buttons on it that we will all care about at different points of the process. But right now, we care about the button that is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, to the right. And it looks like a little wrench. If you if you just missed where I am, I'm on the absolute right of the screen in the properties window. So ignore this list of stuff in the scene, the one below that. Right now I have this thing that says cube, 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 normals, auto smooth, double sided, all that stuff. That's where we are. I'm going to select this button that looks like a wrench. It's called the modifiers panel. These are all called contexts. So I'm going to go to the modifier context. And it looks like a whole lot of nothing right now, except we are going to add a modifier. So I right click my crate to select it. I'm going to add a modifier. And this list suddenly opens up. Now, modifiers are things you apply to objects that don't actually manipulate the geometry. They're just going to um, give the geometry a layer of aesthetic addition in some way that give it the impression of having some, um, some effect put on it. So let me show you an example. There's this one called subdivision surface. You don't have to add this one, but this is the one that makes things super smooth. Um, so that's what our crate looks like if it's smoothed once. And then I can manipulate how smooth it can get. So let's like two and three is pretty good. So that's really smooth. And then I can even go a step further. You don't have to know how to do this yet. But doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, let's see. shading smooth. So it's like super sanded down right now. Imagine, you know, basically you just took this thing and sanded it down a whole bunch. Um, so it's very smooth. Uh, and that's what subdivision surface does, is it actually makes, so if we look at it back in flat rendering again, uh, if I were to apply this, so right now if I hit edit mode, we actually still get to see our nice simple geometry. If I hit apply, on this modifier, you'll see what it did. It actually divides, subdivides this surface and now creates much, much more geometry. 
So before I was saying, oh, you know, this is a tough model to use for portfolio because its triangle count is very high. Well, look at this triangle count now, 2,496 triangles because we subdivided twice. So that's, that's what modifiers do is they make um, modifiers give you sort of a visual illusion without actually applying that to the geometry of the model. So that's what it does. You didn't have to, you know, don't put on subdivision surface uh, and then do what I just did and hit apply. And if you do that, then it controls you a bunch of times. Um, so that's what a modifier does. You know, it lets me do this and get the effect of doing things to the geometry without actually doing it. So I turn that off. Okay. All right. So what do we want to do with modifiers, though? Right now, we want to use the bevel modifier. So I'm going to hit that. And then it's going to... Actually, that's not bad really, really not bad. Um, kind of what I wanted, but just for safety's sake, let's, okay. Um, now, if you've done this and it doesn't quite look like mine, width is 0.1, segments 1, profile 0.5, Material, negative one. I'm going to give you a second to look at it if you can see it in the video. Okay. Now, in this case, I actually am going to apply this because I want to manipulate this geometry. So, apply. Oops. Can't apply in edit mode. Sorry. Tab. Apply. So now, I have this. Here's my modified crate. All right. So this is pretty cool. I don't quite want it to look the way it looks because I have these these like really indented sides and I don't want that. I want them to be a little more flush. So I'm going to go into uh, this is where having two open can be very nice. I'm going to use a 3D view in one of these. Um, I'm going to grab my sides. I'm going to have a 3D view open in one side and then an orthogonal view. So here's my right view in the other. I'm going to hit scale and scale it up a little bit to about there where it's more flush looking with the side. And then I'm going to G, grab, Y, on the y-axis and then kind of shove it this way a little bit. Okay. Yeah, that, that looks better. I think that looks better. That looks more like a frame. Actually, it looks better than the one that I even made as a, as a tutorial piece. Well then, um, so I'm going to do that to each side you know, use orthogonal views like front, side, and top to, okay, in this case I'm going to G and then X, move it, and position it there. Okay, so here's, I'm going to grab the bottom. Uh, I can do that easily with the bottom. G, Z, because I'm going down. Okay, going to move around, do the top up a little bit. Scale. Okay. S, or not S, sorry. G, Z. Boom. Any other ones I need to do? Yes, these sides. Uh, okay. So in this case, in this right viewport is front ortho. Again, what I'm doing here is I'm breaking my rule of front and side and instead using one as a 3D view and one as just switching back between the different orthogonal views. So scale a little bit, G, X. 
So if you're wondering how I can just tell which one to use, depending on what side I'm on, if I look in my 3D view, again, this is why you want the 3D view, you can see which uh, axis is coming out. So if the red line is coming out of the side of the box, um, then the, it's perpendicular to the x-axis. If the green one is coming out of the side of the box, it's perpendicular to the y-axis. And where's my z-axis? My z-axis isn't really showing up, but you know, if nothing's coming out of it, then it's probably the z-axis. If you don't have any this crossing at all, um, then you're not using the default cube that was available on coordinate 0, 0 at the be like when you open Blender for the first time, which is okay, that happens, but uh, you may want to try to move that crate uh, to the middle just to make it easy on yourself. Okay, and then I'm going to go back to my side view here, uh, which will let me see this. So if you're noticing, I'm, I'm working with this so that these sides are each individually viewed as like a line from straight on. I'm not looking at it from this view, I'm looking at it so that I can move them uh, backwards and forwards in their housing, as it were. So scale, move this up, G, Y, to check. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's our crate. There it is in all its crazy glory. So the next video uh, in the series shows you how to manipulate, uh, how to use the uh, UV unwrap functions of this software, and I will leave you to that. I'm going to save this as a whole new file because I, I uh, want to have a version of this saved. Uh, so we're going to call this crate 06. Um, so you should save every time you make a major change, and I realize I didn't do it throughout this entire video, um, but once you get really fast at this, this won't be like such a major change, um, so you can easily do this very quickly. So I'm going to call this crate um, modeling redo because we redid this modeling, and then I like to date my file, so 09, 06, 16. I like to do that so that I can um, know how new models are. And if I'm working on mul multiple in a day, I'll just change the first numbering here. So if it was, if I was working on multiple in a day, I might call it crate 07, crate 08. Um, sometimes I like to put the step of the model here on my naming convection, so modeling redo, meaning this is a redo of the previous video. There's our date. And then I make a habit of putting my initials on models that I save uh, on their names just because if I am working in a team, then uh, if somebody has a question or needs something updated in a model, they can look at my initials and say, oh, Chris Totten worked on this, so I should ask him about it. And it makes uh, having a naming convention like this makes it very easy to work with models. So um, I'm going to save as a Blender file, and I guess that's it. Um, I hope this helped, and good luck.